Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, I'm your host, Scott Carson. Excited to be here this morning. Um, absolutely, it is Tuesday here in the office. Absolutely love the weather that's going on. It's a little dreary. I've seen a little rainy outside there here in Austin, Texas, but it is what it is. But I wanted to uh, discuss today about kind of pricing guides for, for your note business, especially pricing for non performing first, for your contract for deeds. And so I'm going to focus solely on the first lien position, all right? Solely on the first lien position. I'm not going to talk about seconds. I'm definitely not going to talk about thirds. I'm going to talk about what you should be doing in the market today with the, the uh, pricing being where it's at. It's all about pricing guides out there as I kick my camera there, everybody. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, what I want to talk about is, first and foremost, I'm getting emails from people like, oh, my gosh, I spent offers. Uh, the seller says my offers were way too low. I'm freaking out. Or they say I'm smoking crack in my pricing. Well, the thing I would tell you to do is to push back and tell them that they're smoking crack. So like last night on uh, Note Night in America, we had uh, Joel Markovitz on, talk a little about some of the assets. Uh, he had somebody that sent him a tape that were moving stuff. And we had a little bit of a uh, kind of a thing happen last night. Asked the, uh, he sends me a list over Friday. We work on it Friday here in the office to get it up to talk about it last night. And then the seller changes their mind, literally <clears throat> literally changes their mind about a half hour before and pulls a list. <laughs> pulls a list. Now, what's funny is that they decided they wanted to sell the whole thing in one, one tranche, you know, it's a, <clears throat> which I kind of chuckled. I seriously laughed about that when I looked at the assets. Like, there's no way you're going to be able to sell the whole thing off to one buyer. You had some really nice assets and you had some stuff in there that was, it's been vacant for a while. So they were smoking some crack. Well, anyway, Joel comes back and says, yeah, they, they think they, they bought the golden goose and that stuff. And I, and I chuckled on that stuff. I was like, that's fine. We don't waste our time. We went to a second round. But he brought on some assets, though, too. And the seller, this uh, second seller, especially on some of the REOs, eh, was smoking a little crack, wanting something in the 88% range on an REO and some of things like that. So that's what I want to talk about with you guys out there. What are, is pricing out there looking like? And <clears throat> We had uh, Kristen Gerson, which I think Kristen's watching this morning. Hey, Kristen, good good stuff. You did a great job last week with talking about pricing on owner finance notes. Well, I'm not going to talk about owner finance notes. I'm going to talk about kind of the non-performing market where we see things at, especially on first liens and contract for deeds. Okay. Now, there's oftentimes people ask are asking the sellers, what are you looking for? And a lot of them don't want to give you a price point back because they don't want to price against themselves or they are like, they want to get the highest and best, which you can understand that. So I always tell people like, if they don't give you a true price, then go off the stair step model. Now the stair step model, this is a guide. Okay. It is a strict guide. I love it. There's people out there that bash this model saying it's exactly what pricing should be at. And I've always said it's, this is a guide It is not a hard, fast aspect. If somebody's not going to give you a price point, what are you going to do? Pull a price out of your ass? Are you going to pull it out of midair and just throw it on the tape? No, you want to have some sort of guidelines to what you're doing. And the best advice I can give all of you is there, this is a guide. And I'll talk about some of the things that affect it, either going up or going down. All right. So the base thing, and this is off of non-performing notes. Okay. Not REOs, not newly originated aspect, not performing notes, not contract for deeds. This is first, true first lien. So they got a mortgage on it that you're buying the debt on it. Okay. Now, if you consider it a stair step, you start low and you work your way up. All right. So there's basically two phases to the staircase. We'll talk with it. We'll start at the kind of the mid price point of $50,000 assets. Now, if it's got a value of 50,000, <clears> you probably want to start your pricing somewhere in the mid 50% range, 55% roughly. This is talking about what is my light doing here? Uh, this is about as you're going. Uh, buying a one-off. Now, if you're buying in bulk, you should bring the price down a little bit, okay? Now, this is just a, a, a short guide. Relax. There's some things that will affect this amount. So, I don't want people flipping out on me. Oh, my God. And comments on Facebook or, oh, my God, that's not what the seller told me. Just chill a little bit, everybody, okay? It's a guide. So, if you're something that's 50, 50, you know, in the $50,000 value range, as is, not ARV, as is, if somebody tells me they're not going to make an offer, I'd literally put around 55% of the as-is value, provided that the UPB is a lot higher, <clears throat> okay? Now, if the UPB is a lot less, that's an equity deal, 
Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate it. I knew you were watching there. Uh, what you have to realize is if there's not, if there's a lot of equity, like say the house is worth 50, but the bar only owns 25, you're not going to make an offer at, you know, 55% of 50. That would be like 27.5. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. You would drop it down at that point, and we'll talk about equity deals in a minute. Okay, so just chill off of equity deals, all right? If an asset's in the 40 range, okay, my light is going bonkers here real fast. It doesn't like the weather either. If, uh, if, the, price, if the, the asset has a value in the 40s, $40,000 range, you would offer roughly 45% as a starting point. So 45% of 40, what's that come to? It's like 20 something, right? Now, if you go down in the 30,000 range, assets worth 30,000, you have 30 to 39, roughly 35%. Okay. Anything below $30,000 valued, <clears throat> I wouldn't offer above 25%. And that asset's got to be in good condition. The reason for this, why do I offer so low on 30,000 assets below? Well, because if you have an expense, an AC still costs the same across the board. All right. All right. All right. <clears throat> An AC costs the same across the board. A furnace costs the same across the board. If you got to put paint and carpet, yeah, maybe a smaller valued asset, but you still have costs. A roof is costing things like that. So a lot of people avoid the lower valued assets. That's great. There's nothing wrong with avoiding it. But if you're going to buy, you have to realize you should not be paying really above 30 cents on the dollar for an asset below 30 grand. You face issues, especially if it's in a longer foreclosure state. Okay. Now, Let's move back up. You know, like I said, anything below thirty thousand dollars fair market value, it's a twenty five percent offering of that. Okay, provided that the the unpaid balance or they owe more than what the property's worth. Thirties, thirty five percent. Forties range, forty five percent. Fifties range, fifty five percent. Now, if you start getting above higher priced assets, you know, values more than you know sixty. You're going to start seeing, especially if you're buying one-off assets, where the sellers are going to probably start wanting you to be pushed closer to the 60 range, okay? 60, 65% range. Now, here is where the stair-step model guide changes on you, all right? You have to look at foreclosure timeframes, all right? If it's in a state like Texas, Georgia, uh, states like that that have really fast foreclosure timeframes, that skew is going to go up a little bit. <clears throat> All right. That pricing point is going to go up a little bit, especially in Texas here. You're probably going to see something closer to 70 cents on the dollar. Why, why does that freak everybody out? Because here in Texas, it takes 30 days to roughly foreclose. Okay. You can do things relatively quickly and inexpensively here in Texas. Now, how would that number skew South? Well, if you're in a longer foreclosure state, New Jersey, uh, South Carolina, um, maybe parts of Florida, if, if it's not so hot. Florida's hot. A lot of people like Florida, so I think they're overpaying in Florida for the last year or two, okay? So that's what you have to realize. If, if not, if the market's appreciating, and it's a, say, six-month time frame to foreclose, <clears throat> but the market's a hot market, you're going to see that percentage across the board kind of inch up a little bit, 5%, maybe 10%, depending on how, you know, how fast that market's uh, appreciating, and some markets are really hot. Others are really long, so this is why it's important for you when you before you finalize pricing to take a look at the days on market. How long is the properties taking to move? Is it six months? Is it taking you know over six months for the stuff to foreclose? So that's why you adjust that model up and down a little bit, or that dial, I guess you could say, <clears throat> depending on where that market is. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, where that market is in the foreclosure time frame, okay? Now, another a number that you should reduce but your bids buy is the taxes owed, all right? If there's a, a astro, astro, astronomical amount of taxes owed, like five grand, yeah, if you're at 55% on a $55,000 $55, asset, yeah, take 55% minus taxes and then go off of that. Why? Because taxes got to be paid, okay? Now, one of the most important factors I can tell each and every one of you this is a guide, okay? The whole idea is if a seller doesn't give you a price and you make an offering and they counter back, work the numbers. Does the numbers make sense? Take a look at those considerations. Foreclosure timeframes. Does the property need work? Is it in good condition? Is it occupied? Is it vacant? 
Um, what's the likelihood of it to modify? Because then you have to look at your exit strategies as well about what's the ROI going to be. If it's occupied and you've checked the taxes and the taxes are paid, and then you've also looked and seen that um, utilities are up to date, uh, the buyer's got a lot of pride of ownership, then it's probably going to be a modification, a reinstatement of some sort. Okay. So looking at that and running those numbers off the, the offering is still going to be important to see if it is smoking crack. That's why I always like to joke about when I see bids that come in way overpriced. Now, if somebody's selling you above 70%, for the most part, it's not going to make sense to you. Okay. They may think they've got the golden goose. That just doesn't make sense. Now, you have to look at also some other considerations. Um, is the asset a, a bankruptcy deal? Bankruptcy is going to affect your pricing point too on your assets. <clears throat> now, if the BK chapter 13, what does that mean? Well, that means it's probably going to be a loan mod. So it means you're probably going to have about a five-year payment plan on that. That increases the value of the note. You're going to expect to pay more for a BK Chapter 13 note because it's basically cash flow. Okay. That's probably going to go closer to 70, 80 cents on the dollar because it's a BK Chapter 13. Okay. If the BK Chapter 7 has a liquidation, <clears throat> a debtor, uh, where you take the property back, that's going to be basically foreclosure. So you got to look at the time frame on that. Now, the most important thing is our, our good buddy Dan Zatofsky likes to say, oh, you never know. You got to expect for the worst. And I agree to that to a specific point on things. If it's a vacant asset, you better expect it to have a need work done. And then you may want to call Kristen Gerst to come out and sell your dirty carpet. <laughs> okay. On the rehab. Hey, Kate, Kristen, can you come out and get to meet the biggest bang for the buck? Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. All right. <laughs> you see uh, Facebook marketplace to sell your sinks and all that good stuff. Uh, I laugh, but it's I think it's it's a genius uh, tactic out there for some people, especially if you can be local to your deals. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is you have there's there's a lot of guides besides just foreclosure time frames, taxes, condition. You know where is if it's going to be a mod? Is it occupied? Is it vacant? If it's vacant, I would be deducting aspects, especially if it's been vacant for a while. Okay, because it's been vacant for a while, you probably got weedlings. You probably got taxes owed. You may have uh, people that have broken into the house. You may have squatters. This is why I crack up when people counter back. Oh my gosh, the pricing doesn't make sense. Well, okay, is it an asset you still like? Are you not too far off? Or is your bid a little bit south of where their bid is? Is it within five grand, ten grand? If it's close, then send a realtor out, take a look. Maybe you can come back with a true valuation because you have to realize most of these hedge funds. Most of these banks uh, on these dis distressed non-performing notes that we see haven't had anybody go look at the property in a year. They don't know what kind of condition it's in. So if you come back with photos or real pictures of the property and, and provide more proof in your bids, you'll have a stronger you know, leg to stand on when it comes to the countering back and forth. Is this making sense? I would really love if anybody had any questions here just watching live on, on Facebook Live. To go ahead and post the comments there so we can kind of go through that aspect of things. I know I'm probably going to forget something. If you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of our smart TV channels, awesome. Thank you very much. Love, love that you're watching this, especially on our new uh, network breakdown with over 50 smart channels out there. I'd love to hear back from you guys. So if you are watching this, feel free to uh, shoot me an email at scottweclosenotes.com. I'd love to see if you're watching this on, on any of the Roku's or other the smart channels that were out there across the board. But if you're listening, on iTunes, Stitcher, as always, please feel free to drop me a, a message. That's got it. We close notes as well, and we're glad to talk with you about that. But the thing I also want to keep in mind is, like I said before, let's do a quick little recap before anything below 30000 You probably should, since it's a first lien position, you sh probably shouldn't be offering above $0.25 cents of the value in the mid in the 30s, 35%, 40K assets, 45, 50K assets, 55, above 60000 you're going to start seeing higher price on that point because the equity, the check net amount is bigger, obviously. Okay. $100,000 asset, you're probably going to pay somewhere in the mid 50s to 60s. Okay. Now, I would, like I said, I would not go above 70% unless it is in a state like Texas fast foreclosure or the foreclosure is 90% of the way done and the property is in great condition. Okay. So uh, I'll get this contract for deeds in just a second. But like I said, that's the stair-step method from the you know 
below 30, upwards of that. Take a look at the foreclosure time frames. Higher t foreclosure time frame, you reduce it. Big. High taxes, you re reduce your bid by taxes owed. If it's in good condition, great. That's the kind of thing. Hot market, if it's appreciating market, and you're going to ride that market up. I made a lot of money in Florida by buying at the right price and riding it up while I foreclosed on things. Now, I would not necessarily count on the on the extra juice on appreciation. I would focus on where my number's at. If it's vacant, I'm not a fan of it. Because on a vacant asset, you, you're going to have to expect some work to be done. That's why you always want to be conservative if you see that the, the asset is vacant and make sure you put eyes on it and see if you can't sneak inside with a boot hammer. Okay. Now, contract for deeds is a different animal of, of aspects, okay? So, Laura Blunt comes back and asks a question here. says, what are your thoughts on newer CFDs with less than 10 total payments that are non-performing? I got no price expectations. I use basic stair stuff, and they came back with 60 to 70% expectations. We just a bit upwards because they look clean. Okay, great question, great comment. I would never pay 70 cents on the dollar for something that's a non-performing new CFD. It's less than a year old. Okay. Now, what I will look at is a couple things on contract for deeds. And now, a contract for deeds to realize is it's basically going to be an asset <clears throat> that has a value less than fifty grand for the most part, because most banks aren't going to do, uh, most investors or hedge funds aren't going to do a CFD for an asset over fifty thousand. They're probably going to do a true first mortgage and use a mortgage loan originator to write a mortgage on it or on their financing. A contract free deed is something that they're offering on assets below fifty thousand because. It's an easier eviction um, or cancellation of contract if the borrower doesn't pay. So Laura, um, let me hide this here. So to your note, Laura, basically if they're not performing in less than a year, I'm going to look at a couple things specifically with contract for deeds. I'm going to look at the amount of down payment. All right. I'm going to look at the amount of down payment they put down. Now, if they didn't put anything down, 500 bucks or less than a thousand bucks, I would, I would treat this as, as REOs. Okay. Now, you have to look at the cancellation time frame in those states, too. Uh, Michigan's going to be faster than, like, Ohio. Ohio's still going to take a good six months to finish the eviction and cancellation of contract and go from there. So keep that in mind, all right? Um, eyes on the property. If they, are they still occupied? Are the utilities? I would be calling the utilities departments and checking taxes out on that stuff. Now, the thing is you have to keep in mind, too, is if it is occupied, what's your return going to be if you do get it reperforming, Okay. I, I don't like to really pay above 50 cents of the dollar at all. I prefer to be in the 40s of contract for deeds because the fact is they often are lower valued assets. Okay. I prefer to be in 30s most of the time because they're usually the lower valued assets, then you're going to need some work. And the lower value assets, depending on where they're located, may not have the best borrower classification, a borrower pool to draw from. So most of the cases, if they don't get reperforming, we're moving to eviction, looking to, looking to sell it, not looking to re originate. So, um, if, if they think they got I mean, the golden goose at 60s and 70s, I kind of chuckle at that because that just doesn't make sense. They can try that, and you can always adjust your bid back if it makes sense for you on a one-off basis or a small bulk basis. Yes, they give you numbers. They counter you back. Okay, take a look at it and go from there, but it's still the same thing. How much in taxes are owed? How much utilities? You know, how clean is the property? Was it sold? Is the contract for deed as is? Because uh, it needed work. That's the thing you look at. Newly originated CFDs. Just got to be careful about that. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, as Steph says here, very nicely, she says, figure out what your wheelhouse is basically with what you're buying, whether it's your contract for deeds or your first liens and stuff like that. Now, a thing that keep in mind as well is the only time I might pay above 60 cents on the dollar is if there is a lot of equity in the deal, okay? So going back to our previous comment, hey, I see Dan Zatowski's on here, giving a thumbs up on this pricing stuff. Only time I can go above 70 cents a dollar is if there's a ton of equity. So let me give you an example. Say the house is worth 50, they only owe 25, then I would probably come in at 60 to 70 cents of the unpaid balance and offer somewhere in the 20s, you know, 20, you know, thousand for that, knowing that I can evict and take the property back, and then there's, there's a lot of equity on the back end side. Okay, now that's on a contract for deed. On a non-performing note, true note, I'm still going to be very conservative on my bid. Now, now if I take the amount owed, the unpaid balance plus the back payments, and I add that number, those numbers together, and that number e e erases the the equity, 
then I basically am buying a note that has no equity on it. I'm still going to offer below UPB. Never go off a of payoff. There are some sellers, some funds out there that want to go off a of payoff in their sales price. And I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense to me. Okay? That's great, but I'm not going to go off a of payoff. I'm going to go off an of unpaid balance. That's where this market is at. That's what we bid off of. I'm not going to pay off an of unpaid balance. Okay? I care if it's 30 grand, I'm going to go off of the UPB. Now, if there's a lot of equity, that's why I say if there's a lot of equity, still, I'm still going to be conservative. Because you have to realize, if you foreclose, you're going to get paid off on what your payoff is. If your payoff is way well below the, the value of the house, and the house go, it goes to foreclosure, and it, and it sells above what you're paid, that money doesn't come to you. That money goes to the borrower. Okay, So you have to keep in mind, you can tie up your money for a while, go through foreclosure, and only get a small amount. So don't bid high percentages off of UPB if there's a lot of equity. Okay, You only want to do off, you still have to look at the value of the house and determine it. But that's why I often don't buy assets that have a lot of equity. Now, contract for deeds, I'll do that off of, of unpaid balance. Because there's an eviction. It's not a foreclosure. That borrower is not going to get entitled to that equity um, unless it's in a state that requires you to foreclose or it falls into that if they pay 20% down at the time of purchase. Um, the time of that loan origin, not 20, they haven't got 20% equity at the time you foreclose, but they pay 20% down payment at the time of purchase. Okay. Laura comes back here, says, We kept our bids in the 48 ish, the 67%. We thought there was some LSD mixed in with a crack. That's funny. Yeah. Exactly. And and you know what, everybody? People are trying to sell stuff that just doesn't make sense. The beautiful thing about this time of year is a lot of that LSD and crack will wear off as we get closer to the end of the year. People get more motivated to move items. And so what I would do is just follow back up. They countered back higher than what you want to pay. Hey, follow back up with them in 30, 60 days. They, as they hold on to that asset every month, they're incurring costs, servicing, taxes, other things along the way. They may come down to their price. Who knows? Okay. Big Dan is watching here. Uh, this is great info, Scott. Thanks for sharing with the group. Now, that's yeah, awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, Julianne, our officer up in Illinois. Awesome. Thank you as well. So the biggest thing I can tell you, everybody out here, <clears throat> is realize that. Realize what you're looking at. It's just not a hard number. Just don't. Well, I'll run numbers in a spreadsheet. I'll run numbers in a spreadsheet. If I don't get it, those are guides. Like if I take a spreadsheet like last night before we got on, I was looking to it. There was these were assets that were like 70, 80, 90,000. So I'm putting those at 55% at least. Okay. At least I'm going to put it at that, at that amount. Okay. And then run my numbers. I take 12 months of PI, divide that by my pricing of what I would make bid and see if the ROI makes sense. If the ROI is at 7, 8% on a reperforming, I'm probably not going to buy it. I got to look at the equity. In that case, it's a, True foreclosure. I'm not to foreclose to make any money. I still want my return to be roughly in the mid 20s on the back end if I foreclose. So it's at least worth me, worth my time of making 10% and also worth my investor's time. The biggest thing you have to realize if you, you're going to probably have to put some paint and carpet in each one of your assets to get it marketable, to get full value on that. All right. You have to expect that if you're overpaying, like last night they were talking about like an asset being worth 130 nine if you put 30 grand into it and the guy was wanting 85 i'm like that's still too skinny that just doesn't make sense to me i have to get the highest point in the market to try to get my most amount of return why am i going to work any do any work to make five grand or ten grand in a deal that takes a year that's just not smart thinking to me okay as i say before stick to your guns and chris savenia savenia investments there loves the same thing stick your guns on your pricing yeah look just because they want something and you can't come to a point now stick to your guns there's plenty of deals out there They'll be more hitting the market before too long. And let's see here. What is uh, stuff he said? Uh, Laura, sometimes no matter what logical bid pr price you offer, the seller may have pipe dreams of what they think they should get or what they have to get. And as time passes, it changes sometimes too. As you said, a little LSD might be jacking up their crack pipe. Also keep track of your bids that you didn't go through the first time. Exactly. Because following up here in the next 90 days is going to be very valuable to you. Now let's talk about performing notes a little bit for a second here. Okay. Because I, I see people like, hey, I want to make some bids on some performing notes. So a performing note is I constitute somebody who's been making payments for a while now. A true performing note has got 12 months of seasoning. I don't care if it was non-performing to begin with. If it's got 12 months of seasoning, okay, um, still got 12 months of seasoning on it. That's great, okay? Six months of performance, eh, some people will look at it. 
what I will look at is off of a yield. So what I do when I figure in my pricing, and this is a pretty common thing, take your payments, take your 12 months of P&I, divide that by 12% or 15% yield. Because that's usually what you'll see most performing notes that, or re-performing notes that we sell, it's between a 12 and 15 yield. Now, whatever that number is, is roughly what you're offering. And so you have to take a look at that number compared to what their sales price is, because that's a performing note. It's cash flow, especially 12 months of seasoning, bar put some skin in the game, or it's a newly originated note where they put some skin in the game. That, what's, that's what you have to look at, 12 to 15% is what I want to see on my performing stuff for me to be able to make any money, especially if you've got investor money that you have available to at 6 to 8% and you want to arbitrage the difference, you can do that. But if your investor money is at 12%, it's hard to make any money buying a, a, a note, a, a performing note at a 12% yield where you're not going to make any money. Now, Dan asked a question here. If you have to foreclose on a CFD, can you still keep the equity? Depends on what it sells at the auction, Dan. Now, if it doesn't sell at the foreclosure auction and you take the property back, yeah, it's yours. Okay. You're going to put a bid in at the foreclosure auction on a CFD. So if you've got to go the foreclosure route and you're owed 40 with your payoff and everything and it sells for 45, that five grand is going to go to the borrower, not back to you. Okay. So it all depends on what your bid is. If it's above your bid and what you're able to bid, that's going to go back to the borrower. Okay. Doesn't go back to you. If you take the property back, then of course, then it's an REO at that point. You can sell it for whatever you need to at that point. Okay. Dan Deppin, uh, Fusion Notes out of Denver, Colorado. So let's talk about, um, did I say in here? Boom, boom, boom. I think I covered all the questions that people have asked. Now, the question people always ask me is, <clears throat> What do you expect in paying in rehab costs? And I'm like, listen, rehab costs can go both. I don't want to do heavy rehabs. Okay. That's not my business model. All right. If you're a one off investor and you're doing this as a hobby and you don't mind the rehabs, that's great. You can do the rehab aspect. That is not my business model. My business model has changed over the years. Okay. My business model is I want to buy occupied assets. All right. I want to get the bars reperforming as best as I can. And if I do, then I have to take the property back. Okay. Then I try to sell that as fast as possible. Okay. So the question is here that I want to throw out to everybody here. If you're looking at assets that are going to need some work that are outside of your hometown or a place where you've got friends and families, you're probably hurting your business. If it's not in one, two or three markets where you have great teams that you can put together to do those rehabs. If you're doing a lot of one-off stuff, you're actually penalizing your own business and holding your business back by being spread too thin across the board. How do I know this? Because I've been in those shoes in the past. Okay. You don't want to be doing that. You want to be sticking your rehabs to Italy, just a couple of markets and be sure that there's plenty of work there. You don't want to be, I'll give you an example. Um, we discovered this in the Flint market recently when we were out there doing our, our road show through Detroit, we were having, you know, breakfast, having do uh, coffee and donuts with uh, Jennifer and Adam Adams uh, just outside of uh, Flint. Or the Saturday morning up there. And and Adam was telling us about his Flint assets. He was having a hard time getting the rehab crews to come over from Detroit to do it. There weren't a lot of people in Flint that want to do the work. They did. They were through the nose because they were being so busy with what's going on to Detroit. So keep that in mind. If you're buying in secondary markets. A lot of your labor costs are going up. I think Kristen talked about this earlier on last week's show. She's seen labor costs, especially in hot markets like Dallas and other areas, go through the roof because people – it's a supply and demand. There's a lot of demand for it and there's little on supply. So that's also something you want to keep in mind when you're looking at assets, especially if it needs work. I would be pulling back on the assets that need any type of work just because I don't want to run into it with it, especially if it's in a prime market or especially in a secondary market. Now I'm not saying you can't get roofers out there. You can't get some people to come out there, but it's probably going to be more your local handyman versus a true GC and a crew. So you're going to piece that work together and that's not effective in a long run business model as well. If you, okay. Um, question here, Chris, Avani, having out of state rehab is a huge time suck and not worth it. Yeah, it is. That's an, that's a suckage you don't want to embrace. Okay. Um, and then Jim says, wouldn't that have been on foreclosure or eviction? So Jim, so Jim asked a question here. And this goes back to CFDs. Um, yes. If you evicted, you're not worried about it. Okay. You just take the property back. There, it doesn't really matter with what the unpaid balance is exactly. But if you do have to foreclose in some states, you've got to go through a foreclosure route in different aspects. Okay. 
and you have to keep that in mind. And that's going to be more of a conversation with you and your attorney about what's going on in that state specific uh, to the, that contract for deed law. And that's saying each state's a little bit different when it comes to contract for deeds. But I'm loving the questions, everybody. Thank you for asking these. It helps us out here as well as always, uh, providing great information to you guys out there. So let's talk about <clears throat> if you're going to be buying assets in a market that you're going to rehab, you have to expect to take a look at things. I mean, you have to expect some hidden costs. Whatever your, your bid is, if you're getting two or three bids on your construction and stuff like that, you probably need to go in the middle road. You don't want to go the low route on your bids because they're going to undercut you and they're always going to come back and ask for more. It's just the way it always has been. I've never had a low ball bid ever come in on budget. Okay. Never had that happen. A high ball bid, you don't want to do that either. So it's somewhere in the middle there is really what you want to do. But keep that in the middle bid, especially in your rehabs, in mind because that's you got to look at it. All right. What's the time frame for that? What's the market doing? Where are days of market? Just because you can pick up an asset cheap, doesn't mean it's a good deal until you start looking at days on market. I had an investor coming one time. He's like, oh, I'm buying this asset in Texas. I'm getting the Texas asset like 30 cents of value. I'm like, whoa, where's it at? They're like, LaGrange, Texas. I'm like, whoa, wait a second. You know where LaGrange is at? I'm like, yeah, is that where ZZ Top's from? I started laughing. I was like, well, what's the value of the asset? Well, it's about 80000 after repair. I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense. What's it worth right now? What is it in your note business? It's all about what the value is as is right now, okay? As is, not ARV, not after repair value, okay? Because right? a lot of fix and flippers get into the business going off their, their MAO, as they used to call it, the maximum allowable offer on a fix and flip, which, which would have been ARV times 70% minus repair and money costs. That would have been your highest bid. You don't do that in the note business, okay? That equation does not work. <laughs> it's not computable. With notes. If it is, you're paying overpaying and you're over hurting, especially when you take the asset back or don't take the asset back in a mod. So going back to this range, the guy's paying at 33 cents. It was worth like, oh, it's like worth 60. It needs about 10 grand worth of work. I'm like, okay, uh, what's your minute cost? Well, I'm using heart money's gonna fund it to me at 12%. I'm like, ooh, that's gonna hurt. I go, what are the days on market? He goes, 368 days. I'm like, oh, you're gonna have to hold that asset. You have to expect to hold that asset for a year to get that thing sold. I said that would be the biggest red flag to walk away. Okay. Walk away from the asset, be done with it. Okay. Another thing that's important in your pricing is, is looking at the market too. If you see a lot of empty houses or trashed out houses in your block, it's bringing the value down. No matter what their BPO says or their Zillow or Zestimate or they, their AVM says, Take a look at the comps, see what they're looking at, because oftentimes they're buying these comps in big bulks or they're adjusting the value to best hit, hit their number. Okay. Uh, we I know of a company that actually adjusts the dates of the comps, and you can't find the comps anywhere. They actually go on and adjust the dates on their the proposal values to escalate the values. And I think that's fraud. That's fret out fraud if they can't provide the true comps and stuff like that. Okay. One thing to get a CMA. But when you pull a true BPO and the dates are adjusted on sales and time frames on sale, that's straight up fraud. That's not, you should not be doing business with people like that. Okay. All right. But that's when, I'm, like I say, everybody, going back to the original thing, um, going back, <clears throat> it steps us Lots of reasons not to buy certain assets. Those reasons are so important to eat. Yeah. Look, guys and gals, if I can recommend anything, in the note space or the CFD, CFD space. I always say pick out a couple markets. I, I start off by saying picking out five states. Most of you need to probably focus on two to begin with, two or three, and get to know that state. Know the time frames. Know your attorneys. Okay? Okay? Get to know your vendors in a local area. Talking to other investors in a mastermind group or our WCN crew page or any of those pages. Talking to people who are using things. OK, because those vendors will often help because of its economy scale. If they can get business from four people, they're glad to do it and keep the price that makes sense across the board. It's it's and you don't want to be trying to do it rehabs, as Chris Venny say, I guarantee Dan Zatowski and a lot of other people say, focus on one or two markets. Get to know that market. Reach out to the vendors. Reach out to the turnkey. You can align yourself with like a Michael Jordan from uh, Strategy Investment Group out of Detroit to help you out with the rehabs. That's a great crew. Or Dave Pearchin 
from uh, Columbus Houses, buy Columbus Houses out of Columbus, or any of our, our buddies are doing turnkey stuff in any parts of the country, focus on those. Those are great people to work with. In some cases, it may not make sense for you to buy debt in that place and rehab. It may make better sense for you just to buy a, a rental or turnkey in those cases. That's fine. Depends on what your schedule is like. If you are rehabbing assets, you're going to need this to be a full time. You can't do that on a part time schedule because you will just get run rapid and your foreclosures and your rehabs will take forever to get done. Uh, Gail, good morning, Gail. Uh, yep, you'll have to watch the valuable info a bit later. Uh, it's a company out of uh, Texas here, Jeff Wolf, Wolfman. Oh, uh, I've seen it on a couple other places. I've seen it from some other like wholesalers do the same thing too. So it's just not really one company. I've seen wholesalers adjust things. Where I think we've all seen things. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen where people have sent over values and the, they had three BPOs and they went with the highest one. They left the other two BPOs in the file, even though the, those values came low. So there's a lot of people that like to adjust and escalate bids. You have to be careful of that, okay? Um, <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up there. Steph says, know the city requirements and what specific or special rules they may have, or liens, licenses, registration, security. Just a few things that are so different across the country. Hashtag Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland's one of those cities that is not making it beneficial to fix and flip homes because they put a, a what is it, $10,000 bond on every new asset, every house that you got to take it. That just doesn't make sense. They're making it impossible. Other areas of the country, if you're buying, you know, I think Seattle, if it turns into rental, you got to pay somebody to leave. That just There's things that are going on in different parts of the country that just don't make sense. So that's why I think the, the biggest bang for the buck is not those higher end cities like that. Not, Cle not that Cleveland's higher end, but like Seattle and things like that. Let's focus on your markets that make sense. Focus on assets where somebody's living in them. Somebody's made some payments. Maybe they had just a financial hiccup. I got a phone call from a borrower yesterday. Um, actually called the office here. I've answered the phone. And the guy, uh, his wife, the older guy on the phone, knew that immediately. Wife has been going through cancer. He's been sick. He's been working with the city on the utilities, paying the taxes and stuff like that. Been late. Uh, got a letter from our attorney to start the cancellation. Picked up the phone and called us, tracked us down. I had a nice conversation with the guy talking about things. I said, listen, that's fine. I'm going to put you in touch with uh, my uh, my asset manager who handles that stuff, can figure out what your payments are. We can create something that makes sense in a win-win and stuff like that. Okay, I'm, I'd much rather keep somebody in the house who's taking care of the house, who has a vested interest, who's been there for five years, six years, trying to help them out as long as they're willing to meet me halfway. What's that meeting me halfway? Hey, let's start making a payment plan. Let's get you started on something. Right? I don't necessarily need to take your property back. I'd rather be the bank on it. And so that's what's so beautiful about being a bank is cash flow is king. And yes, you do have equity because you've bought the note at a discount. So you've got that note equity in there to do a lot of stuff with over the next six or 12 months. Or if they do, just take their head in the sand and won't call you back. Then you have the foreclosure aspect or cancellation of contract. So there's a lot of things you can do. But like I said before, at the very beginning, that stair step method. All right. That stair-step model is a guide, all right? It's a guide for you. It's not a hard, fast rule. It's a guide. And you don't know if it's going to be accurate, depending on what the seller, what their expectations are. So that's why I always ask. You get pricing expectations before you do anything. I asked somebody the other day, hey, do you want to jump in on this deal? Help me out with it. I'm like, okay, what's the pricing? You didn't know pricing expectations. Like, okay, first and foremost, before you send me anything, I don't need me, I don't care about the address, I care about the property. Until you have pricing expectations, it's not worth me even wasting my time on. Okay. Until you know what the price is, okay, you don't really have anything. If they won't give you pricing expectations, okay, they at least they tell you that. Highest and best, okay. I'm not gonna waste my time with it. Most of the time. Unless I'm going to buy in bulk. If they want the best and highest and an auction basis, that's fine. Let somebody take the asset down. I'll wait and follow up a, the week after. Hey, did you sell that asset? What was the final bid price? Okay, great. Well, if they don't close, here is where my bid came in at, or I would have bid individually and go from there. I'm not going to get an auction fighting point like a lot of people do for the most part. Now, what I do like is if they've got you know, strike prices. Here's what we're looking for. Here's where we're at. It's great. Then we can make some things happen and you'll see more of that happen you gotta realize everybody it's only october middle of october right now we still got two and a half months left in the year 
and there's about be it's going to get crazier as we get closer to the end of the year. So keep that in mind. Follow up with your bids. If your bids came in low. You think the people are smoking crack. That crack will wear off. In reality, it would sit in hopefully before December 28th or 27th uh, on that aspect of last week. Okay. So hopefully it was helpful, everybody. Like I said before, just use the stair step model as a pricing guide. It's going to vary a little bit up or down, depending on a lot of things. Uh, if you see people bashing the stair step model, tell them then ask them how are they coming to pricing? And I guarantee they won't have an answer. Then I guarantee they'll probably be overpaying. And I'm not saying pricing has not gone up. I will agree to that in a lot of places. But you have to realize, stick to your guns. You're in the note business, not the REO business. You're in the note business, not in the fix and flip business. Okay. You're in the note business, not the rental business. Okay. A lot of people want to get into one thing and they end up doing four or five other things. That's fine as long as you know that and you're prepared for that. But keep in mind, if you, the more straight and narrow and focused you can be, the better off you'll be in the long run. So, guys, go out, make something happen, and uh, go make some offers, and we'll see you at the top, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.